Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Dr. Thomas Hemingway here. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss out. One of those topics that I think is really misunderstood, and I'll have to say this recent data that came out, like it's crazy. I mean, for me actually as a physician, and I consider myself a scientist, I've I've done research, I've published in journals in the past, and I am a critical reviewer, critical thinker. I always love to ask questions, which I would encourage you to do as well. Ask questions. Don't take my word for it. Like look up the study for yourself. In fact, I'm going to give you the link in the show notes to this study, or you can message me and I can get that to you right away. This study that is all the rave recently was in nature, nature medicine, February 27th, uh, 2023 entitled the artificial sweetener erythritol and cardiovascular event risk. So it's a catchy title, (laughs) but actually it says nothing about any kind of causality of heart attacks or cardiac events, nothing. In fact, what they actually looked at was not even anything to do with heart attacks. Really. It was super interesting because they looked at the plasma or blood level of erythritol in people who already had heart disease. These are people who had had previous heart heart attacks, some with what's called congestive heart failure. Um, And it was actually a pretty big percentage, just dropping back 45% had uh, bona fide uh, coronary artery disease, 15% had congestive heart failure, another 77, 0% had hypertension. So these were not a healthy cohort, so to speak. These were folks that already had some version of either hypertension or heart disease, and they were not super healthy. And what was interesting is all they did was they took a blood test level looking for erythritol. And what's interesting is erythritol is actually made in your body, but the way that it's made, it's not the way that you ingest it. So those of you that have, you know, these keto type foods that are using these low calorie or zero calorie sweeteners that are sort of, you know, quote, natural or healthier things like stevia, a monk fruit, and of course, erythritol, these are all considered natural sweeteners because they are natural. They're found in nature. They're not you know, combobulated, you know, and put together in the, I don't know if that's even a word, but they're not thrown to de- together in a chemistry lab, like the NutraSweet, which is our Spartame or sucralose, which is Splenda or saccharin, which is sweet and low. Those are actually all <laughs> manufactured in a industrial chemical lab. Whereas uh, for example, erythritol, it's actually found naturally. And, and some of my favorite fruit, in fact, uh, berries, uh, grapes, for example, you know, grapes have so many amazing antioxidants and the sugar, one of the sugars in there is actually erythritol found naturally in grapes. Also watermelon, honeydew melon, cantaloupe, like these just amazing sweet melons that, oh, geez, it should be three months from now, right? (laughs) Summer should be coming around. I I just looking around at the snow, it just seems like it's never coming, but many of these wonderful fruits have erythritol in them naturally occurring. It's actually real natural stuff. So In the body, interestingly enough, when we consume these types of uh, either fruit like the melon or watermelon, you know, cantaloupe, what have you, these melons or grapes, for example, when we consume them, um, there's actually not a lot of erythritol that gets into the bloodstream, believe it or not. Most of it actually that gets absorbed is actually excreted through the urine. You know, the kidneys dump it out. In fact, over 80% of it. So not a lot actually ever gets into the bloodstream. The primary way interestingly enough, that erythritol gets into the bloodstream is through the PPP. No, 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 not OPP, you know, like the song that was popular for me in high school, but PPP, which is the pentose phosphate pathway, which is actually a way in the body in red blood cells and others that actually you can make erythritol, but you know what it's made from? It's made from sugar. So the more sugar you consume in your diet, guess what? Your plasma levels of erythritol, which was what was actually measured in the study, the plasma levels, not how much you ate of erythritol, had nothing to do with how much you ate of erythritol. They didn't even measure that. They didn't even look at that. So like the way that they've said, oh, erythritol, it's going to cause heart disease or stroke or whatever. Like it's crazy the kind of claims that came out on the headline news and everything, because they actually never even measured the consumption or eating of erythritol or foods with erythritol or foods that are manufactured by humans that erythritol is used as a sweetener. They did not even look at that. They looked at the plasma 
blood levels of erythritol, like I said, which your body makes it when you eat too much sugar, because you can make erythritol in the body through this pathway, the PPP, not OPP, the pentose phosphate pathway, you can make erythritol from sugar, from sucrose, from fructose, you know, the high fructose corn syrup. Guess what? That will in this pathway, the PPP pathway turn into erythritol and it can be measured in the blood. So big surprise, the people who ate the most sugar, guess what? They had the highest levels of erythritol in their blood because this is actually, it's probably even a mechanism that the body uses to try to sort of save itself because too much sugar in the blood, you guys know about this, right? Hyperglycemia, right? It can be diabetes. It can even go to a florid, dangerous, life-threatening state called diabetic ketoacidosis, which is when the blood sugar is through the roof. You're also acidotic and you can die from this. So the body wants to protect itself from these high sugar levels. And one of the ways in which it can do that is it can change the sugar into this substance called erythritol. It can do it through the pentose phosphate pathway, and it can do that in the blood. The red blood cells can actually do that. This may even be a protective mechanism, but I bet you didn't hear that in the news because they weren't really thinking that. Sounds like maybe they had an agenda. I don't know. Maybe science having an agenda. Who knew, right? Well, we won't get into that because (laughs) too much science out there has ulterior motive and agenda. But in this quote unquote study, all they did was measure the erythritol level in the blood. They had two um, cohorts. They did sort of the initial one where it was like 1500 patients or so. And they said, oh, look, in this group, the higher the level of erythritol, the higher the chance that they were going to go on to have some kind of adverse cardiac event, maybe a heart attack, maybe a stroke, maybe even death, maybe, maybe heart failure. You know, one of these adverse cardiac endpoints, we followed these people that we were looking at that most of them had heart disease anyway. Like I told you, 70% had high blood pressure, um, 45% heart disease, another 15% ingestive heart failure. So these are sick people. And those that had the highest levels of erythritol in their blood, guess what? They probably ate the highest amount of sugar. And we all know that sugar is not awesome for our bodies. It's super inflammatory. And we know that heart disease is an inflammatory condition. So Big surprise, those that had the highest levels of erythritol, guess what? They had more incidence of cardiac events. It said nothing about people actually consuming erythritol, like from these natural or lower calorie sweeteners like erythritol in their food. It said nothing. It didn't even look at that. It looked at just the levels in their blood, which could have all have come from potentially, who knows? We don't know. We're just guessing from a high sugar diet, from lots of corn syrup, from lots of sugar, (laughs) lots of any of these sugars, like I said, in the body, they can be converted, especially in the red blood cell through this pentose phosphate pathway into erythritol, which is what they measured. And so that was the first part of the study. They just measured the level of erythritol in the blood, which may or may not have had anything to do with consuming food with erythritol, like watermelon or cantaloupe or my favorite grapes and berries and things like that. They didn't even look at that. Or if you do like they have some of these fancy kind of keto bars, my daughter, as you guys know, is type one diabetic. Sometimes we'll buy her some keto bars or keto ice cream, and they often will have erythritol as a sweetener because it doesn't have a bunch of sugar. It's not going to jack up her blood sugar, which is not awesome, right? Because the more her blood sugar jacks up, the more inflammation she has. And so these sort of lower calorie things that are out there, whether they be a sweet treat or what have you, or even just a natural fruit that has erythritol in it. um, I doubt these contribute to heart disease. I mean, the jury's still out. This study did not even look at that. And then the final part of the study makes me laugh even more because they had, I think a total of, let me just pull it up. They had a total of, uh, eight healthy, eight healthy volunteers. In fact, um, let me, pull up the actual study so you can see it because I just find it fascinating that this kind of stuff gets published present day in one of the premier scientific journals, like premier, this is nature medicine, one of the premier sweeteners. So, or excuse me, journals. So the title, like I said, is called the artificial sweetener, erythritol and cardiovascular event risk, 2023, February 27th, nature, uh, nature medicine. And the second part of the study right here, I'm going to highlight it for you. N equals eight. They had a total of not even 10, a total of eight volunteers. So gosh, super, super tiny, tiny study. 
And what they did, they gave them large amounts of erythritol every day. It was like over 30 grams. I forget the exact number. I'm just looking at the abstract here. And guess what? They gave them over 30 grams a day, which is more than probably any normal human would consume of erythritol. And guess what? They could measure some erythritol in the blood. Big whopping surprise, right? Because at least 20% of it may be available in the blood, right? We know that about 80% of it gets absorbed and then dumped out, peed out in the urine. But hey, 20% of a big number is still a big number and we can certainly measure it. So eight healthy people had <laughs> erythritol in their blood after they had, I think it was two weeks time they did this. Let's see if it says that. Um, I don't think they say that here, but when you read the full study, I think it was two weeks, they were given over 30 grams a day, which is way more than you or I would eat. And um, anyway, it... It was a crappy, crappy study. And this made big time. Every headline news outlet was just blasting this erythritol thing, sweetener erythritol and cardiovascular event risk when actually it wasn't even looked at. This, the fact that they used the artificial sweetener erythritol and cardiovascular event risk in the title is, I think it's, 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 it's disheartening. It's misleading because they actually did not even study the artificial sweetener erythritol in its consumption. They did not even study that with respect to heart disease or cardiovascular event risk. They did not even study that. Remember, all they did was they looked at the people who had an elevated erythritol level in their blood, which my humble opinion is that probably these people were eating way too much sugar and that's how they got the erythritol in the blood in the first place, that they had a higher risk and they were a high risk group in the first place. They already, most of them had heart disease or hypertension, which is high blood pressure. And this was observational. So this is the problem with most of the so-called nutritional research studies that look at food is they are just like this study. They are observational, which is not the highest level of evidence. You guys may have heard of the so-called randomized control trial, right? Where you take two groups, one group who has either placebo, whereas the other group has the you know study intervention, whether it be a drug, like a pharmaceutical or a food, say like erythritol, for example, they would actually need to do that study and take two groups, one group getting X amount of erythritol per day, the other group not. And then they would have to follow them for a specified period of time to see if it had any effect on cardiac event risk. Did they do that? No, of course they did not do that. Those studies take time. They're more expensive. It's so much easier to do a one-time blood sample and then just follow these people for a couple of years and then see which ones had more heart attacks. And remember, that erythritol level in the blood, it could have been just from eating too much sugar. It could have been eating zero erythritol in the food, or it could be a lot. We just don't even know because they didn't even do that test. So it is just a simple observational study. And when you do that, that's called epidemiology. You follow a group of people over a period of time, and then you get some outcome, which is may or may not be correlated to whatever you're looking at. So in this group, they saw, hey, the people that had the highest level of erythritol in their blood at the first part of the study, the three years later, I think it was when they looked at cardiac event risk. Well, guess what? They had more event risk because most likely they ate more sugar, but we don't know because they didn't look at that. But we cannot say that erythritol causes heart disease or heart attack or what have you, because they didn't even look at that. They didn't do a study using a randomized control trial, which was double blind. They didn't do any of that. They just followed people over time. And then they had this data. They said, well, it could be correlated. So that's the word we got to use correlation, which is that when you do an observational study, you find something and it may be related to whatever you're looking at, like heart attack or heart disease or, or heart or cardiac event. It may be related or it may not be related. We can't say that it's causative. We can't say that erythritol causes heart disease because they didn't do a study to do that. You'd have to do a randomized control tr trial. So lots of problems with this paper that came out just about a month ago that was causing all these crazy headlines. Lots of problems with it. It wasn't ever designed to predict if erythritol causes heart disease, heart attack, any of that. It's not a causation type of a study. It's correlation at best. And they didn't even measure what people were eating in their diet. It was a simple erythritol level, which who knows could have just been because they were eating too much sugar. So really bad study. In my humble opinion, it's super unfortunate that it's got so much press and negative press towards erythritol, which was a naturally and is a naturally occurring substance in fruit, like the berries, the grapes, the melons that I love watermelon. Oh my gosh. I can't wait till summer makes me think about hot summer days and nice chilled watermelon. They didn't even look at that. So 
<laughs> it's so interesting because it, it's, it can be hard to tease out. If you just listen to headlines, you would have had no idea about all that stuff, like no idea at all. And yet the study did not even look at erythritol consumption. It did not even look at that. And yet they were making all these claims. And so here's my, here's my approach. So do I go out and seek foods containing erythritol as a sweetener? No, I don't go out and seek them, especially if they're manufactured in a, you know, I hate to say lab, but let's just say a big food plant, if you will, industrialized food. I try to avoid industrialized food for the most part, the so-called processed foods, because we as Americans eat way too many of them. It's over 60% of our diet in the U S is processed food. And in kids it's 67 plus percent of their food is highly processed. I mean, for me, this is food like substances, not even real food. So I don't go out and seek erythritol in my foods. Um, do some of the foods I eat occasionally have erythritol? Maybe the ones that I'm going to be eating that would be more likely to have it would be the melons. Like come summertime, love watermelon on a nice picnic or barbecue or whatever, or the grapes and berries and so on. Like that would be the food that I would be likely consuming that had erythritol. But let's say, for example, my daughter's keto ice cream, which we, she might have once a week or whatever, um, had erythritol in it. Would I say she could never have it? No, probably not. I mean, Hey, the kids will be kids. And you know, if, if all of her friends are having ice cream and she wants to have a little bite and hers is with a little erythritol, I think, I think that's fine. It's a natural sweetener. It's certainly not a predominant part of diet. Like, like I said, I'm not going to go out and look for foods that have it in there, especially processed ones. Cause I try to avoid processed foods at all costs, but am I going to avoid them altogether and never eat them again in my lifetime? Probably not. I mean, if, if there's any dentists out there, they kind of love erythritol because there's lots of data looking at how erythritol as a sweetener is way better than like sugar in candy, for example, or sweet treats, because it actually has a mechanism in which it sort of prevents the bacteria from breaking down the teeth or causing caries or cavities. There's like an anti-cavity process with this erythritol and the other so-called sugar al uh, alcohols like xylitol and, and so forth. So there's actually dentists out there that love erythritol and xylitol and sorbitol for this reason, because they decrease the formation of caries or cavities. Like I said, I'm not going to encourage anybody to go out and buy a bunch of candy with erythritol in it because the dentists say so. Like try to just avoid processed foods in the first place because for the most part, you know, processed foods are not awesome. <laughs> and, um, you know, you should be looking for number one, real, whole, natural food that, you know, that is grown in the field or that is raised out in nature regeneratively the way that it was supposed to happen. Like when you eat real food, you don't even have to worry about this kind of thing. And so, so that's my approach. You know, I think right now um, I was looking at, uh, there was one thing that my kid has that's a chewable vitamin and lots of kids, chewable vitamins have kind of a sweet something so that they'll eat them. Right. And thank goodness it doesn't have a bunch of sugar in it. Cause some will have sugar. Some will have sucralose, which I'm definitely not a fan of. In fact, while we're, while we're kind of talking about some of these other artificial sweeteners, you know, for example, sucralose, aspartame, um, which is NutraSweet, ACE K, um, the other saccharin, which is sweet and low. Sucralose is Splenda. I'm not a fan of these. These are from the lab. Like they're not even naturally occurring. I mean, like I mentioned, erythritol is naturally occurring. You can get it out in plants and fruit in nature. This other stuff, sucralose, aspartame, ACE K, um, saccharin, you can't find that stuff in nature. Not at all. That's like seriously highly processed from chemicals in a lab. And like some of the processing is crazy on that stuff. And, and in mammals, especially a lot that have been studied, there's been way more mammals studied than humans, you know, different rodents and things that have had, you know, decades of research done with these artificial sweeteners causing all kinds of problems, including cancer, including liver disease, like, uh, insulin resistance and, um, you know, hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, and, and just issues with weight gain. in a lot of cases, like they're inflammatory, like, why would I consume anything with these artificial sweeteners? I mean, if you can avoid all of them, get only your sweetness from natural things. My go-tos, I'll just be honest with you. We, we do have something sweet. Occasionally we make, make these things on the weekends, usually on a Sunday called chaffles, which, uh, are basically used with a waffle iron, but they're eggs. They're like egg waffles. <laughs> and so sometimes my kids will throw a little syrup on there, either the natural maple syrup <coughs> from Canada, or I have some kids that love 
kind of the uh, peanut butter and honey approach. And uh, they use a natural local honey, which is amazing. Honey has so many benefits, but yet it's sweet. You know, you just drizzle a little bit over the top or occasionally they'll have a, a bowl of Greek yogurt and um, grain fee free granola and some berries, and they might drizzle a teeny bit of honey. So my go-tos for sweetening things are naturally occurring honey. Hopefully the, you know, organic local, local honey is amazing because it's going to have a lot of the antibodies and things that you're going to, you know, best, um, they're going to be useful for you because you're in that same environment. So local organic honey is amazing as well as, um, organic maple syrup, you know, those are my go-tos. I'll just be honest. I don't even, we don't even have sugar to sprinkle on stuff. We don't have sweet and low Splenda, like none of that kind of stuff to sprinkle into our drinks or anything. We don't use any of that. Like if anything, just a drop or two of honey, if you want to sweeten up your hot beverage of choice, whatever that may be, um, or, you know, drizzle on some of your, your little treats. My treats are Greek yogurt with berries, occasionally some grain-free granola on top. And I might drizzle a teeny bit of honey on that as well. So that's what I do. That's the go-to. I'm not looking for a sugar substitute. Certainly I'm not looking for a chemical one, like the sucralose, the um, aspartame, ACE K, um, saccharin, things like that. I'm not looking for those at all because they wreak havoc on the gut as well. They decrease the diversity, which is not a good thing. You want diversity in your gut, your microbiota. I did a whole podcast, gosh, it's been a year or two ago on the artificial sweeteners. So um, I'll try to link that up in the show notes as well, where I talk about all of these uh, in detail. And in fact, I will um, share with you a article that uh, is one of my favorites that actually came out only one month preceding this crazy one that I just shared with you about erythritol. In fact, I'm going to pull it up just so you can see it um, because this article looked at, this is probably one of the best review articles on erythritol. It's from the journal Nutrients. And it was literally just a month prior to this crazy one that was one of the worst studies ever as far as the, the conclusions they tried to draw. But the Nutrients 2023, January 15th, it's entitled Erythritol, an in-depth discussion of its potential to be a beneficial dietary component, okay? So they talk about this uh, PPP, right? The pentose phosphate pathway that I alluded to, which is how your body makes erythritol and you can measure it in the blood. They talk about, um, here's a, a mention of, they've had long-term mammal studies, rodent studies showing how erythritol can lower body weight or body fat can lower it. We don't have a lot of human studies yet. It's still, erythritol is still relatively new. Um, but this is actually a really good review article. Talks all about the natural occurring erythritol that I alluded to. Um, this is actually interesting. I didn't even talk about this, but this pathway, the PPP uh, pathway, <laughs> the pentose pyrophosphate uh, pathway, um, it's present in all basically all mammals, all organisms really. And it through that pathway, you can actually build things that we need, like DNA, nucleic acid for DNA. Um, this thing called NAD, which is super helpful, NADPH as well. It's an essential cofactor in so many things, including regenerating what we all want, the antioxidant glutathione, which is really good for, for our heart, right? So there's lots of ways that this pentose phosphate pathway can be beneficial. And the end product is erythritol. So, you know, it's anyway, <laughs> it's super interesting. This article, I would definitely um, take a look at it. So erythritol, as I mentioned, is actually naturally occurring in plants, especially um, the melons and things, the grapes, mostly they, uh, they make it by fermenting it. Um, yeast is used to ferment it. So that's how they make it commercially because the yields are higher. They don't have to use a big chemistry lab to do so. Um, this article talks about the safety and it's been studied, let's see, for at least 15 years, the safety, it was permitted back in 2006, um, or actually earlier 2003, even the European Union um, regarded it as safe. So there's lots of interesting stuff. It talks about the metabolism, health effects, the tooth decay thing that I mentioned, how it uh, is um, sort of preventing tooth decay. So super interesting. I would encourage you to read this article. Um, it's uh, I didn't find it biased at all. It actually has lots of references to the literature that's out there on erythritol, which uh, is not a lot because it's still relatively new, but there are some that uh, show some improvements in type two diabetes, for example, um, there it was talking about that. Um, anyway, they say conclusions, erythritol is naturally occurring. It's safe. It's a non-nutritive sugar alcohol. So basically it's not giving you a bunch of calories. 
Um, compared to others, it's mostly absorbed and then excreted in the urine. There's minimal amounts that reach the colon, um, but not a lot. And uh, anyway, I, I found it to be super interesting. And I would encourage you all to read this article because it just has way more data, way more studies. Um, and so Nutrient 2023, erythritol, an in-depth discussion of its potential to be a beneficial dietary component. So so that's it for that. It's I think my party line is that this <laughs> other study, which uh, was not a randomized controlled trial and so cannot say anything about causation of erythritol causing heart attack or heart disease, even though a lot of the news media outlets were kind of saying that, can't even be said from the type of data that was collected. And just remember that uh, always have an inquiring mind. Don't take my word for it. Go read the study yourself and you'll see that it was not even designed to do that. They literally took an erythritol blood level. They did not take stock of what people were eating as far as erythritol containing foods or just a whole mess of sugar, right? Because the average American, and these were, were sicker than the average American, right? Because most of them had some kind of heart disease or hypertension, what have you. Most likely they were eating 150 plus grams of sugar a day because the so-called average Westerner eats nearly 150, 130 to 150, depending on what source you look at, pounds of sugar per year. And guess what? A bunch of that's going to end up in erythritol in the blood. So anyway, crappy, crappy study. We can't draw conclusions about causation at all. And uh, so don't get overly concerned about erythritol. Like I said, I'm not going to be seeking foods that have it in there. If once in a while I happen to eat a keto ice cream, a bite or two of that, and it has erythritol, I'm not going to freak out about it. Even though the dentist would love it. If I went to the store and bought a bunch of candy with erythritol and started chewing and sucking on that, I'm not going to do that either. Like, come on, let's be realistic here, <laughs> but, uh, I'm not afraid of it. That's the bottom line, especially in its naturally occurring form, which is in fruit for crying out loud in grapes, my favorite, right? Grapes and berries and melon coming up this summer. I'm going to be grinding plenty of watermelon, which has plenty of erythritol in it, cantaloupe and honeydew melon as well. I love all the melons. I love all the natural food. So bottom line party words is don't get freaked out about erythritol. This study in nature medicine that just came out does not even speak about consumption of erythritol. Nobody ever told you that probably before, but hey, you're hearing it live right here, right now for me. You've seen the studies yourself. You can go look them up, ask a lot of questions, read the studies yourself and draw your own conclusions. But sadly, I was underwhelmed, unimpressed, and actually, frankly, a little bit disappointed with how this study was propagated in the news media because it is not causative showing heart disease and it was not designed for that. And I'm not afraid of erythritol because it's natural and it's found in fruit, like I mentioned. So that's the party line. I hope that uh, this is helpful to you. I would love to you to go check out my other podcasts on artificial sweeteners. I don't want to belabor all that now. I did an in-depth in uh, article, or I should say podcast on that about two years ago, I think on the artificial sweeteners digging in deep with the ones that we're seeing all over the place, right? The NutraSweet, the uh, Sweet and Low, the Sucralose, which are in so many things from these sweet treats to beverages. And I would try to avoid them because they are as artificial and chemically derived as you can imagine. And they're not great for our gut. They also have been shown, especially in other mammals, to cause things like cancer, liver disease, and, and so on. And so Yikes, not uh, top of my list of awesome things because they're not natural. Number one, look for natural things, look for real whole food and check out my previous podcast there. So I hope that's helpful. <laughs> I had fun reading the studies. It's, it's always eye-opening to me to hear one thing, you know, on the news media and on social and see how people are talking about this stuff. And then to actually read the study itself, it can be a totally different game. So anyway, uh, always be inquisitive. Um, ask a lot of questions. Don't take my word for it. Look at the stuff yourself. And so I'll put the links in the show notes and, or if somehow I forget, just message me, Dr. Thomas Hemingway, follow along there. I provide tons of con content there on Instagram. I love to talk about these things because I just love to help you to share health pearls that can change your life, up level your health, help you to live alive and to thrive, not simply 
just survive your life. And if you want to join me in my Thrive community where I do live Q&As, in fact, my last month uh, one, we actually talked all about erythritol. So my community there knew this stuff and hands down. So we, we talked all about it and a bunch of other things. And you guys can be part of that. You can be part of that. Check out my website, thomashemingway.com. You'll see a link to my Thrive community. You'll see a link to my new book, Preventable five powerful practices to avoid disease and build unshakable health. And if you drop a re review of this podcast, share it, share it out. You will be entered to win a free copy of my book, Preventable, which will be coming out soon. You'll get access right away to a free course that I did talking all about those five powerful practices. So please follow me on social, Dr. Thomas Hemingway. I can't wait to see you soon. Aloha. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss out on any future episode. And I'd love to hear your comments and feedback. If there's any topic you'd love to hear about, you're dying to know, burning questions, please comment below and let me know what future topics are of interest to you.